Hi, I'm Mike Tachik, President of Dairyland Electrical Industries. Today we'll be having a short discussion on the basics of isolation and safety grounding in cathodically protected structures. There are important issues that must be addressed in order to have both a functioning cathodic protection system and one that's safe for personnel and public. Cathodic protection systems are necessary to prevent corrosion on important assets such as pipelines and tanks. CP current is direct current and comes from an anode or an impressed current system that puts out current to be picked up at defects in the pipeline or structure coating, which shifts the voltage of the structure more negative, and upon reaching a negative enough value dictated by industry criteria, you have considered the structure to be cathodically protected. Sacrificial anode systems are consumed in the process of putting out limited amounts of current, while rectifier-based systems are powered from a source and can provide large or small amounts of current and are adjustable. So CP is important, but can have problems when it conflicts with another need, which is safety grounding. CP systems can only work well if they're connected to the structure to be protected and isolated from all other structures, such as grounding systems or another company's pipeline. When I say the word isolated, I mean electrically isolated, and the way we do that is via good dielectric coatings and insulated joints. If this is done properly, then the pipeline is the only metallic object that the CP system needs to protect. If CP is connected to more than just the pipeline, then there are some negative effects. If the structure is not electrically isolated from other metallic objects, then they're all combined for the purpose of cathodic protection. It's not an ideal situation and likely will not meet the corrosion prevention goals. For example, if your pipeline is touching or bonded to a grounding system, CP must also protect that added surface area. Not only is that bad, but the grounding material is probably copper, which is far more positive on the galvanic series of metals, creating a larger voltage difference and pushing more CP current to the copper. But it's actually worse yet. Your local facility grounding system is bonded to the utility grounding system by default, so your CP system is protecting them too. Now you're in trouble because somebody designed the CP system to take care of a few defects in the pipeline coating, but the total bare area to be protected now is a huge and unknown quantity. You'll be able to see the effect quite clearly, however, as the CP current demand will be much higher than planned. Not that that would help you. Current that's going elsewhere and not arriving at the pipe defect results in a low CP voltage, which is not acceptable. Here's a partial list for the galvanic series of metals in order of their corrosion characteristics. Just a few of them. The least active metals are on the bottom of the list, and the most active are on top. This means that the more active metals will sacrifice themselves to protect the less active metals if they're bonded together in the soil. That is why magnesium and zinc are often used intentionally as anodes, and why copper is so detrimental if it's tied into a CP system. Also, the further apart the two metals are in the galvanic series, the more driving voltage exists between them and the more resulting corrosion current will flow if they're connected together. High CP current output will shorten anode life, requiring more frequent replacement or will require excessive rectifier output. That'll make your power bill higher even if the rectifier can still accomplish the task. However, the CP voltage being too low will result in possible corrosion and lack of compliance to the CP criteria, neither of which accomplishes your company's goals. These consequences will cost money either in digs, repairs, replacement, or fines. So it's apparent now that isolation is needed to have reasonable CP system operation. So if isolation is good for CP, is that the end of the story? We just leave all structures ideally electrically isolated from all other structures and from grounding systems? Well, yes, isolation is helpful for CP, but it also introduces a new problem regarding safety. If the structure is isolated from ground, and always was under every condition that could be imposed, then it could rise to an unacceptably high voltage under some conditions. After all, the concept of isolation doesn't discriminate. 
If good coatings allow a structure to be easily shifted in voltage for CP, then it can also easily be shifted in voltage during an electrical disturbance. You want the one, you don't want the other, however you get both with this gift called isolation. But clearly we can't tolerate the pipeline rising to thousands of volts if personnel safety is to be valued. There are plenty of bad things that can happen to pipelines and other isolated structures. With ever-improving coatings and insulators, it's easy to have a high voltage rise due to several phenomena. These hazards are lightning, AC faults, and AC steady state induction. Let's look at each of these hazards. One is lightning, which is prevalent in many areas of the world and can have small or large effects as there are large variations in the magnitude of the lightning waveform that can appear. Another effect comes from the proximity of power lines to pipelines, where the magnetic field that comes from the current flow on the power line interacts with the steel pipe, causing a voltage rise. There are small and large versions of this effect. When you find induced AC on your pipeline by measuring, seeing a small arc connecting or disconnecting something on the pipeline, or basically just getting shocked, you're experiencing the low end of this induction effect. It's still a real issue to be addressed, but there are worse things. If there's an AC fault on the power line, much more current flows temporarily, and the induction effect increases drastically, resulting in perhaps thousands of volts on the pipe. So how do you get these effects off of your isolated structure, or keep them from getting on, or applying whatever magic is needed to stop this from happening? The answer is simply that bonding one structure to another and the structures to ground will positively keep the voltage difference between them to a low and safe level. One pipeline can't rise in voltage compared to another if they're bonded together. A tank can't rise in voltage if it's bonded to ground. If there's electrical equipment involved, codes likely require grounding anyway. So the answer appears to be that everything should be bonded and grounded, and then all problems would be solved, right? Well, let's see. If everything were bonded and grounded, then how are we going to obtain adequate cathodic protection? We just shorted it all out to ground, and I just got through explaining how important it is to isolate structures from each other and from ground if we're going to effectively provide cathodic protection. It turns out that we must do both things at the same time. Isolate the CP from other foreign objects and effectively ground the unacceptable higher voltage effects. There are safe and effective ways to do both simultaneously, and Dairyland has the answer to that problem. Now that we understand why we want to isolate pipelines and structures from the grounding systems, yet need grounding too, how is that accomplished? Such a device exists, and it's called a decoupler by the corrosion prevention industry. Dairyland invented solid-state decouplers for the corrosion industry many years ago to serve this exact need. With our background in electrical power equipment design, we're well suited to the task, and these devices have been used over the last several decades around the world. So let's talk about what these devices do. The purpose of these devices is to block cathodic protection current under normal conditions so the structure appears to be isolated, just as we desired. But the devices do much more and perform a grounding and bonding function when the voltage attempts to rise on the pipeline. At that point, the Dairyland decoupler turns on and performs its positive protective function of solidly tying the structure to ground or other bonding points to keep the voltage low and safe. When the event is over, it automatically switches back to the normal DC blocking mode. And there isn't a limit to how many times it can perform this function. Let's talk further about device characteristics. Under normal operating conditions, decouplers have a low resistance to AC, typically milliohms or thousandths of an ohm, and high resistance to DC, typically many thousands of ohms. This characteristic applies up to a predetermined blocking voltage, and the typical blocking voltage levels are several volts, but could be up to tens of volts in some limited applications. This voltage must be above any normal CP voltage that's present and which appears across the decoupler terminals. For AC that is induced onto a pipeline from overhead power lines, the decoupler appears as a short circuit and passes the available alternating current through it 
to the grounding system as if it were a solid, hardwired bond to ground. However, no CP current flows to ground, as we've discussed. In order to handle these conditions, decouplers must be rated for high levels of lightning current, AC fault current, and AC steady state current. Typical values are 100,000 amps peak value for lightning, several thousand amps AC fault current conditions, and tens of amps for steady state AC conditions. So where do we use the principles that we've learned? What locations would suffer these kinds of hazardous conditions? First, consider where you've seen an arc when you're connecting something on the pipeline or disconnecting something, such as an insulated fitting. That is typically induced AC current that you just interrupted. Or think about the insulated joint that separates a cathodically protected pipeline from a grounded station. The insulation is only about one-eighth of an inch thick and could easily sustain damage due to an over-voltage condition unless it was protected. But there are more sites to consider, including some that are hard to imagine that a hazard could be present, and others for which the problem is understood, but it doesn't appear to, that there's any solution. Let's briefly point out a few of them, but we won't have enough time in this discussion to discuss these in depth. For more information, please reference other Dairyland articles, videos, or resources if you'd like to dive deeper. Joint insulation needs over-voltage protection if it's to survive a lightning strike or an AC fault. It may seem that keeping my pipe and equipment permanently isolated away from your pipe is a good thing, but no flange insulation or monolithic joint can withstand the voltage that comes from a lightning strike or an AC fault. Failure would take your pipeline out of service, or worse, so the key is to bond across the insulated joint using a decoupler and the shortest cable length that's possible ideally measured in inches, not feet. Bus bar mounting kits are also useful for accomplishing this. The reason for the short cable lengths is explained in other Dairyland articles, and it's very important for lightning over voltage protection. A section of pipe that's electrically floating is an accident waiting to happen. It can rise to any voltage if it isn't referenced to ground for safety. Grounding the pipe through a decoupler mitigates the hazards without affecting CP. It could look something like this picture. Now if you contact the pipe, you and the grounding system stay at nearly the same voltage. You go up and down together. Grounding mats for step and touch voltage protection are a further subset of the last discussion. Mats are used in a small area surrounding a riser or test station to keep a worker over the mat while contacting the pipe or the test leads. Dairyland has more information on grounding mats designs and safety, but for now, let's just consider that the mat needs to be bonded to the pipe for worker safety, but without affecting CP. It would be bonded together, as shown here, using a decoupler to provide these dual functions. My grounding system and your grounding system next door may not be bonded together. You might say, why worry, since we each have a grounding system? But what if you could contact both systems at once and they weren't at the same voltage? Now you might be thinking, how could a grounding system go up in voltage? It's in the earth. Well, during a lightning event or an AC fault, one facility could be affected but not the other, leading to a voltage difference between the two. And how would you actually contact these grounding systems? Probably it would occur by contacting objects that are bonded to ground, which could be facility piping or a fence, but other possibilities include support structures or buildings. Could you choose to just bond the grounding systems and or the fence together with a suitable wire? Of course, if there's no CP system involved, you could do that. But sometimes CP is tied into the grounding of a facility even though it's not ideal, and it must be kept separate from foreign grounding systems via a decoupler. And we show that in this picture. Now let's look at a reverse situation. In the case of electrical equipment that's part of a CP system, that equipment has a grounding conductor, as required by electrical codes. That grounding conductor will bond the equipment, and therefore the cathodically protected structure also, to the grounding system. So the safety issues have been addressed already, but CP is negatively affected. 
so you can't just remove the required grounding conductor. This seems like an impossible situation, but a decoupler that's certified to meet the grounding codes can be used to solve this problem. It's inserted in series in the grounding conductor to block DC while complying with the codes. Our problem is solved in a way that serves both needs, not compromising safety or CP. So we've looked at the needs of the CP system, which is to obtain DC isolation, while learning about the safety issues that we must also address. Consider which structures on your system may not be properly referenced to ground or to other objects for safety and address those locations. Dairyland decouplers are used for many applications that center around these two needs and many more related topics. If we can be of service, please contact us. We freely spend time with anyone who needs assistance in sorting out isolation, grounding, and safety issues of any kind. We have a lot of experience, but if we don't know the answer, we probably know someone else in a specialized area who might be of service and can, we can refer you to them. We enjoy being a resource to the industry, so please make use of us.